Twice a year, what we like to do is take time to reflect on who we are as a church. And, and I call these vision weekends because it gives us a chance to really focus on what are we doing as a church? How are we staying on course with the heartbeat of God's purposes and plans for us as a church? And so uh, twice a year, once in the summer and once sometime in the spring, we just pause and just reflect on are we making the impact that God really wants us to make? And the reason why we do this is because Vision has to always be followed in order for it to be effective. And so look at our first scripture here, that, which is what um, uh, Proverbs lets us know. Proverbs says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. In other words, when there is no God-inspired direction, people will basically do whatever they think is right. And one of the challenges with being in a society and a culture that champions busyness is that we can be real busy, but yet not doing the right things. And that's one of the things we as a church have to guard against, and any, any church needs to guard against, because we can get so busy doing so much that we aren't doing the main thing we're called to do. And so the Bible reminds us, rightfully so, that when there is, a, where there is no prophetic vision, people will just go in every direction. But when there is prophetic vision, then the people can flow with it and see God accomplish his purposes and plans. And that's really what God is calling us to do. God is calling us to just be reminded, that's why we have these vision weekends, to be reminded this is why we're here as a church. Because, you know, we're coming off the summer slump and, you know, people have taken vacations and all of that. And that's wonderful that you've taken vacations. But we're about to enter into this fall one of the greatest seasons of outreach that we do as a church. And we really want to make sure that we as a church are ready to reach out and touch people so that their lives can be touched and transformed. Amen? So what I want to do is just quickly go through some statistics of where God has taken us this year so we can prepare our hearts for what God is going to do. So I want to just quickly flip through and get to um, our stats here real quick. So I want you to see how we've been able to touch people's lives. As of last Sunday, 89 people made first-time decisions for Jesus Christ. Amen. No, no, heaven is rejoicing at that number. 89 people have said, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life for the first time. That means 89 people's lives and families have been touched and transformed for the better. For those who have rededicated their lives, 92 people have said, I want to reactivate my relationship with Jesus Christ. And look at this, baptisms. 30 people thus far this year have been water baptized. Now, last year around this time, it was like eight people who had been baptized. Look at what God has done for us. 30 people have been baptized. And then here's an interesting statistic. For our church online, the, those who are watching us on the stream, on average, about 70 people per week are tuning in to one of our three services. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of... Of, of opportunity with this church online. And I've been praying recently because one of the convictions I, I have is that, that we need to not only have a church where people can come to it, but we also need to be able to take the church out to where people are. And that means taking the church out to prisons, to nursing homes, taking the church out to even hospitals, and, and, and listen, taking the church out to even coffee shops and other places where people gather, and our church online platform will enable us to make the church portable so wherever you've got a, a mobile phone or an iPad, you can have church. Amen. So I believe there's some tremendous opportunities that we're going to see in the fall about how God can help us expand and take the church out um, beyond these four walls. And these, these numbers are important not just because they're numbers, but because every number represents a name, and every name has a story. And so these, these 89 people, they all have a story of how God touched them and transformed them. We're actually going to end the service today with a, with a video testimony from, from one of the numbers from a couple of years ago, uh, just to help you see that, that we're about touching people's lives. 
So why does Hope Cathedral exist? I just want to put up our vision so that you can, um, you can know um, of a surety. This is why this church is here. And for those who are taking notes, make sure you fill in the blanks there. If you're not taking notes, please take notes. Because I'd love for you to make sure that you, because we, we have to be on the same page as it relates to our vision so that we don't get astray and, 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 and start doing things that are not part of who we are and what God has called us to be. So Hope Cathedral exists to touch people with the love of God. So our purpose as a church is to touch people. And that's a very intentional word, touch, with the love of God. And my hope is that when you came on this campus, even today, that you sensed the love of God from the people you encountered, from the worship service, that you, you felt God's love and you were touched by his presence. That everything we do is about touching people with God's love. And we do that so that they become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Our goal is not to, to crank out good church members. Our goal is to develop and disciple train passionate Christ followers. Because that's really what it's all about. That name right there, Jesus. And so what, what has become important to uh, my wife and I over the years as we've looked at our church and what God has called us to do is this uh, scripture in Mark chapter 1, which I believe is the manifesto, as it were, of who we are as a church and what I believe God is calling us to model in this current generation and age. Because what Hope Cathedral represents is actually a modern-day miracle. Okay? Now let me tell you why. Because in an age where people are being more divided and separated and there's more animosity and hatred among people, God has called us as a church to come together with, across different racial, ethnic, national lines in order to be one family under a loving God. And that is something that we can all be proud of. No, that's something we can all be proud of. We're modeling something for the world to see that we can, with one purpose, come together, put differences aside, and celebrate the uniqueness that every person brings. That's what this church is all about. And that is a modern day miracle to see lives being touched and transformed. And we're not concerned or hung up with what their race is or their ethnicity or their nationality. All we want to know is if you want to know Jesus, come on and be a part of our family. Amen. 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 So let's look at this scripture in, in Mark chapter one. I wanna, I'm going to give you a running commentary as we walk through it. Um, and then I want to give you three points to, um, to help summarize what we learned from this text. So there's a man, um, a man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus. So a man with a skin disease. Now leprosy was highly contagious, and if not was, is a highly contagious disease that, 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 that affects you on a spectrum of you can have little spots on your skin all the way to a severity where your, your, your digits start to fall off because your, your, your body starts to um, almost decay while, you're, you know, while it's eating away at your body. So it's a, it's a very horrible disease. And so this man was diagnosed with leprosy, and immediately when a person was diagnosed with leprosy, they were cut off from the community. So the moment you saw some little white spots show up on your skin, you went to the priest, the priest would say, you're unclean, get out. And you had to leave the community, you had to leave your family, your children, your social networks, everything, you had to leave it all and go live outside of the community. That's what this, this man was dealing with. But he heard Jesus was nearby. And so he broke all of the religious rules and ran and fell at the feet of Jesus, and he begged him to be healed. I want us to understand and never lose sight of the fact that there's a hurting world out there. And I believe that beyond all of the, um, the, the animosity that appears to be against Jesus, I still believe that hurting people know that the only way they can get healed is through Jesus. And so there is a world out there that's just waiting for us to show up to point the way so that they can get the help they need. Notice the humility that this leper represents. 
He comes to Jesus. He doesn't stand up and say, all right, I know you're the son of God. Heal me. No. He kneels down, sign of humility. He actually starts to beg Jesus to heal him. And look what happens. He asks Jesus, if you are willing. Now notice, he didn't question if Jesus had the ability. If so, he would have said, if you can. He wanted to know, Jesus, are you willing? I know you can heal me because I've heard of you healing other people. I've heard of you feeding multitudes. I've heard of you casting out demons. I've heard you change people's lives. I know you have the power to do it, but I just want to know, are you willing to do it for me? And I dare say that's part of what struggling people are asking right now. They want to know, Lord, even though I'm a sinner, even though I've messed up, even though I feel unworthy, are you still willing to help me in my brokenness? And you know what the answer is to that? Yes, Jesus is willing. And notice what this leprous man wanted. He wanted healing, but he also wanted cleansing. They are two different things. Healing dealt with the physical sickness. Cleansing dealt with him being made whole as a person. You see, he could have been healed, but still not repatriated with his family. He could have been healed and still not allowed to come back into the community. And what he wanted Jesus to do was to take care of his sickness, but also get him reconnected with the community. I'm I'm going somewhere with this. So look at what happens. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. That's where we get our mission from, touching people with the love of God. Because Jesus in front of this leprous man... Jesus didn't get angry at him, and he could have gotten angry at him because this this leprous man was breaking the religious code of the day. He had no right being around other people who did not have leprosy. He was breaking the religious and social rules around how to handle that sickness. Jesus could have said, stay away. You could infect all of us. But that's not what happened. Jesus was moved with, come on, say this word, Compassion. Now, compassion is different from pity. You see, pity simply means to feel sorry for someone. And in all honesty, if I can be honest, we're in church, right? When I pity someone, part of what I'm saying is, I'm so glad it's you and not me. That's what pity does. Compassion says, I see where you are. I will get down where you are and help bring you out of there. Pity says, it sure is a shame that your marriage is in trouble. I hope it gets better. Compassion says, what can I do to help? You got the difference? So Jesus was moved with compassion. And look at what he does. He reaches out and he touches A man with a highly contagious disease. Let that sink in. He knew the man had leprosy. He could see it all on him. But he did not allow the sickness, the pain, the hurt of that leper to stop him from touching him. So I wonder... What situations and conditions are you not willing to touch? What people have you determined are off limits for you? For Jesus, he was willing to even touch the untouchable. 
He was willing to love the unlovable. And he was able to do it because his heart was filled with compassion. You know, there's too much indifference that we as Christians live with. We've become so hardened of heart that really stuff doesn't even move us. We hear of people who are in trouble, people who are hungry, families who are going through difficult situations, and really quietly in our heart, we say a prayer of thanksgiving that it's not us. What happened to us? What's happened is we've allowed the world to crush out of us a heart of compassion. You may not be able to help everybody in need, but you should always feel compassion towards them. You should always, when you see a person who's hurting, your heart ought to go out to them. Because when God sees them, his heart goes out to them. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that he is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. In other words, if I'm going through something, if I'm hurting, God hurts with me. Let that sink in. If I'm hurting, God is identifying through Jesus with the hurt that I'm feeling. So how can we see people around us who are struggling? How can you see your neighbors going through difficult times and you just turn a blind eye? How can you see people who are hungry, people who are naked, people who are struggling in life, people who are sick, and all you do is just say, mm, my, my, I guess I'll just pray for them. No. God is calling us to come up a little higher. God is calling us to have a heart of compassion so that what I can do I will do. I may not be able to do everything, but if I can add my little bit to help the situation, then I've fulfilled what Jesus tells me to do. So look at what, let's go on. So Jesus responds then, and Jesus says, I am willing, and then he declares, be healed. And the Bible says, instantly, the leprosy disappeared. So when Jesus touched him, his leprosy was still very much active. But after he spoke the word of healing, the leprosy disappeared. So that satisfied the first request of the leper, which was to be healed, right? The second thing the leper asked for was to be cleansed, to be repatriated, to be made whole, which means to be reconnected with community. And so look what happens. Let's go on to the next slide. Then Jesus sent him on his way with a stern warning. And I really wonder why Jesus would give him a warning like this, because I think in the back of Jesus's mind, he knew this wasn't going to happen. In fact, every time Jesus told someone, don't tell anybody, the very next thing they did was go tell somebody. So I think that Jesus must have a sense of humor because he's, he's like, you know, look, shh, don't tell anybody, huh? Don't tell anybody. I once was blind, but now I see I got to tell somebody. I once was a leper, but now I'm clean. I got to tell somebody. So Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. Instead, go to the priest. Now, here's the important part. Because now he's dealing with his cleansing. He got his healing. He's healed now. And Jesus saw the excitement on his face. But Jesus said, uh-uh. You asked for something else. You asked to be cleansed, to be made whole. So I need you to go to the priest. And let him examine you. The same priest that kicked you out will now need to certify that you're healed so that everybody can welcome you back to the community. You see, this leper could have been healed but yet still disconnected from his family. And that's not wholeness. Wholeness is not just you becoming a Christian. Wholeness is you becoming a Christian and then those around you getting connected with Jesus as well so that you can now, your family can be whole and you can truly live in the joy that God has for you. So he tells, tells them to go to the priest, take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. 
This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. You see, Jesus was trying to get this man his second request, which was that he would be connected with other people. And may I tell you honestly that you're not healed just because you're feeling good. You and I are, 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 are whole when we're connected with other people. Too often we think that we can live our lives as individual islands, but that's not true. We need each other. And if you, have, if you are under the delusion that you can make it through life by yourself, I'm here to tell you it doesn't work like that. You may be healed, but you're not whole. And that's why Jesus calls us out of ecclesia. The church means those who are called out. We are called out from the world and we're called together to be a family to one another, to be connected to one another so that by our working together, walking together, worshiping together, living together, that we can show the world that people can truly get along with one another and truly be on the same page and love God and love each other. That's what God wants. Not just that we be healed, but that we be made whole through community. And so the Bible goes on to say that this man went and spread the word. See, he, he, Jesus told him, look, don't say anything. No, he went and spread the word, proclaiming to everyone what had happened. And as a result, large crowds soon surrounded Jesus, and he couldn't publicly enter a town anywhere. He had to stay out in the secluded places. But people from, come on, everywhere kept coming to him. This man went and told people, look, <laughs> I once was a leper, but Jesus healed me. And he told so many people that Jesus couldn't go anywhere without people knowing who he was. So he retreated to be secluded. And wherever he went, people went to follow him. So let me give you these three points that I believe will, will help strengthen you today. Point number one, fill in the blank here. Those far from God expect hope, help, healing, and wholeness. People who are broken, people who have experienced life, they need some hope. They need to know better things are ahead. They need some help. They need you to engage with them on the level of their problem. It may be a failed marriage. It may be a financial challenge they're going through. It may be uh, children who are on the wrong path. It may be a physical illness that has is, that is stricken them. It may be that their career is off track. It may be that they're caught in an addiction and they need help getting free. Whatever the help is that they need, we as the church have to be able to have mechanisms to get people, get connected to the hurting people so that we can then get them the healing that they need. That's why if your marriage is going through difficulties or you want to strengthen your marriage, that's why we offer couples small groups because we're trying to get you the healing that you need. If you're, if you're a man and you're dealing with issues, we have men's small groups. If you just are wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian and how to follow Jesus, we have, we have life small groups that teach you the, the basics of the Christian faith and how to truly be free and be forgiven uh, in Jesus Christ. If you want to know how to deepen your, your, your walk with God through prayer, we have prayer small groups. We've, we've got these groups. Why? Because we want to bring people hope, help, and healing in the context of wholeness, which is people. Every, all of us are on a journey. We're all at different places on the journey, but we're all on a journey. Well, let me tell you, it is so much nicer when you can take a journey with other people. You know, we, um, we dropped our daughter off at college a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, of course, it was a sad thing, and I was crying and boo-hooing and, and all of that. Um, you know, as yes, I was. Okay, I'm just being honest. Y'all know I'm sensitive. So, um, and man, when we got in that car to drive back, the only saving grace for that 15-hour trip was that we didn't have to make it alone. 
And I'm saying that because many of us in life, we try to take this journey alone. The journey of life is a whole lot better when you got somebody to journey with you. Because in the moments when you're sad, somebody's there to help you. In the moments when you're ready to give up, somebody's there to say, keep on going. Don't get weary. Because God wants all of us not just to have hope, help, and healing, but that we get to wholeness as well. And wholeness only comes through community. Second thing I want us to see is that we must be motivated by compassion to see results. If we're going to see people's lives changed, our heart can only be full of compassion. Now, um, the scripture that we talked about in in Mark chapter 1, that word compassion there in some manuscripts is actually not compassion, but the word anger. And um, it's interesting because there are certain situations in Scripture when Jesus actually gets angry at situations. There there are certain circumstances that that people endure that when Jesus comes upon them, the Bible actually says he gets angry. One of them is the Lazarus story. Yeah, when he comes and finds out that Lazarus is dead in that tomb, the Bible actually says that Jesus got angry. He wasn't angry at Lazarus. He wasn't angry at at Mary and Martha. No, Jesus had a righteous indignation that how could this happen to a child of God? And I believe that that, that, that when we go through our broken periods and we go through our hurting periods and we we are dealing with the, the pain of life, I believe on a certain level we ought to have a sense of righteous indignation that says, not on my watch. I'm not going to let your marriage fail on my watch. I'm going to do whatever's necessary to help save your marriage. I'm not going to let your kids be lost to the street. Not on my watch. I'm not going to let you check out of life and give up on life and, and, and throw away your life. Not on my watch. That has to be our heart's cry. Not on my watch. Come on, can you say that with me? Not on my watch. That has to be our cry. No longer are we going to let these, this division, and this evil co- consume us, not on my watch. I'm going to do my part to see results. And then point number three, and we're done. Our only goal is to bring glory to Jesus. And the reason why I wanted to, to do this as the third point is because in our culture, we like accolades. And, and, and listen, we ought to always appreciate people. But you have to understand, what we're doing for God is not for any human applause or accolades. What we're doing is so that we can bring glory to Jesus. And if I live my life not waiting to hear the applause of men, but waiting to hear the applause of heaven... And when I stand before God, if I never got a plaque, a certificate, or an appreciation banquet, when I stand before him, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And that will really be enough for me. Because it's all about bringing glory to his name. So how do we keep this miracle going? God has been faithful to this church. How do we keep it going? How do we become the church that's not about us, but it's about the next person? See, how do we become the church that's not consumed about what we want, but we become the church that's consumed about what they need? Two things I want to tell you. First thing is, Pray like everything depends on God, because it does. And I want to give you a personal invitation. Every Saturday morning at 7 a.m., we gather right here in this auditorium and we pray. 
We pray for the prayer requests. We pray for the needs of this church. We pray for this community, this state, this nation, this world. We pray because we know that we are on God's agenda. And the only way God's agenda is going to take place and be accomplished is if we humble ourselves and pray. So I want to I invite you, 7 a.m. every Saturday morning, join us in prayer. God is doing miraculous things. And I'm thankful that we have a place where we can come and pray. But there's a second part to this. And that is we have to serve like everything depends on us. So we pray like everything depends on God. Because it does. But then we serve with our whole heart like everything depends on us. And so my call to you is, are you willing to roll up your sleeves and touch some broken people? Are you willing to not overlook the hurt and the pain that's right around you? I'm not asking you to go to a foreign country. There's hurt and pain right on your street. There's hurt and pain right in the cubicle next to you on your job. There's hurt and pain in that person that you always seem to see at the grocery store, no matter what time you go there. Are you willing to do your part to see somebody's life changed? Started off this message by saying every number has a name. Every name has a story. Well, I want to introduce some of you who, who may not have known her and her family, Andrea Hutchison. She and her family came to Hope uh, shortly after uh, the Superstorm Sandy. They relocated to this area uh, to help uh, people uh, rebuild their homes after the storm and everything like that. And God providentially had them live right across the street from Quinn and I. And uh, in the process of getting to know them, we invited them to the church and God touched their family and transformed their family. They've since relocated back to Denver. And so I just want you to see a piece of it to help you understand that every name, every number has a name, and every name has a story. So I am on my way home from work, and it is late at night, and I'm driving. And uh, I'm about to do something I said I would probably never do. I am a sinner. That's the first thing I want to make clear. This is simply about sharing my experience and hope that someone else, any one person, can overcome their lack of understanding, their fear, their anger, and their hatred towards Christ, Christians, people like myself. So a few years ago, we moved to New Jersey and we moved in across the street from a pastor. Um, they became our friends and they invited us to their church. And David and I had been talking for some time about going back to church and we'd gone to a few services here and there at various churches and had never found anything that we were truly comfortable with. So when the pastor across the street, and this is Pastor Trevon Gross and his wife, Pastor Quinn Gross, and I showed up with my husband. I stayed initially for the music. Uh, something about the infectious joy of the worship that they did was out of control. It, it was so amazing that I could not ignore how it made me feel. It felt like I was joining a family and so I kept coming back. I became closer to Pastor Quinn um, and started listening to her. She. She was just this woman who was so amazing to me. She was no matter what steadfast and constant and stable and sane and joyous and free and strong. She was everything I wanted to be. And I'd always heard from motivational speakers that if you want what someone else has, ask them how they got it. And I did just that. I went over to pastor's house and I sat on her couch and I asked her, on her couch, she prayed with me the prayer of salvation. I gave my life to Christ, and a few weeks later, I was baptized, and at that time, I was still very skeptical and doubtful. I was still a um, kind of agnostic type. I continued to go to church. I went through the process of becoming a Christian. I was a, a Christian in name. Um, some big changes happened in our lives. We, you know, our... Um, our children, or my husband's children, came to live with us. I became a stepmother to two teenagers. Um, we 
had to move several times. I, uh, there was a whole lot of stuff going on. In, in December um, of that year, I'd had a miscarriage. Uh, we were trying to have another baby and it wasn't working out. Uh, by March of that year, I was broken. Um, completely broken. I was filled with resentment. I was resentful at the church even because as kind as they were wonderful to me, all these promises that Pastor was making in his sermons were not coming true for me. Um, I hit a roadblock. My life hit a, a breaking point at that time. I couldn't handle it anymore. My husband and I were on the verge of divorce because we couldn't get along. I was resentful and angry and bitter towards everyone. I didn't want to exist that way anymore. And it was so painful, the thought of my family falling apart and my life falling apart and my heart breaking that I went to church and gave myself truly to the Lord. I had no options left. It, my plane was uh, going down. It was crashing. I was dying inside and I had nowhere else to turn but God. And just like anyone else on a crashing plane, I threw a Hail Mary prayer. And I went to God at the altar of the church and I said, got on my knees and cried and was just, God, I don't know what you have planned for me. I don't know what's coming next. I, I don't even care at this point. Just give me the grace and the strength to get through it and forgive me for all of the things I've done to cause this, for all of the ways that I've broken myself and broken my family. Forgive us all. This is all in your hands. I fully surrender to you, Lord. There's nothing left that I can do. I, By the end of that day, <laughs> things changed. I received the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's no way to put it other than that. I went through a 180 degree immediate change in my life. Not gone back to the way I was before I was truly saved, before I was sanctified. What I'm here to tell you is that since I came to the Lord, since I received the Holy Spirit, since I was truly and genuinely saved, my life has been nothing but better. Uh, I've received this joy of peace that is unsurpassed. It's unexplainable. Even on the hardest of hard times, I'm able to walk through it with this strength that I've never, ever had before. I have changed, that there is something different, and that even if it's annoying to people who don't believe, I'm a better person than I used to be. Because truly and honestly, I love the Lord with all my heart and soul, and I love you, my neighbor, as well. I want to take a moment while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed just for you to ask God, what are you saying to me?